everybody. Today I'm going to talk to you about five ways that you can cue your reader. So when we're talking about cueing the reader, we're basically letting them know and be prepared about what you're going to talk about next. You're giving them a prompt to maybe move into action or think about what it is you are saying. Cueing your reader can help make sure that they understand what you're trying to say, especially as you're moving from one idea to a different idea. You definitely want to make sure that you're not just walking along at a steady pace and suddenly you turn right and your reader's like, wait, why did we turn right? I don't understand. I thought we were going to from point A to point B. Why did we take a detour? Okay, so cueing your reader is going to do just that. Prepare the reader to know that you are taking that detour and why you're taking it. Okay, so let's get started looking at five ways that you can cue your reader. All right, so the basic five ways that we are cueing our reader is through thesis and forecasting statements that orient readers to ideas and organization. We have paragraphing that groups related ideas and details, cohesive devices connecting ideas to one another and bring about clarity, transitions signal relationships or shifts in meaning, and headings and subheadings group related paragraphs and help readers locate specific information quickly. So let's look at our first cue the reader technique, which is orienting statements. So our first orienting statement is a thesis. Your thesis is probably the most important sentence in your entire essay because it announces your main idea to the reader. And in a way it summarizes all your main ideas in this one little sentence maybe two sentences. So it's great for readers to know what the main ideas are. And especially since the thesis is generally in the introduction paragraph, it helps them know right off the bat what you're going to say, what your main arguments are going to be, et cetera. And of course, you're going to build on these and explain them later in the essay, but your thesis statement lets the reader know beforehand what you're going to talk about. On an additional note, a thesis also really helps you, the writer, to stay on topic and helps kind of guide you throughout your writing and orient you to what your main points are going to be. Okay, so theses are wonderful. Um, please check out more information about thesis statements because they will change your essay so much for the better. Okay, the next type of orienting statement is a general forecasting statement which previews the topics. A lot of time, a forecasting statement is going to be you know, a topic sentence that might guide readers back to the thesis statement, but it might just be a general preview that happens somewhere where you say like, we'll talk about this later, or, or it might say, you know, I'm going to talk about this and then this and then that. And the reader is prepared that this is the order that things are going to be in. And so in general, a forecasting statement is going to overview the way that the thesis is going to be developed. So let's look at our next cueing the reader strategy, which is paragraphing. Now, a lot of you probably know exactly what a paragraph is, and you didn't really think about it since you've been writing in paragraphs since elementary school, and it was just because somebody told you to, and you're like, I didn't think about it that much, um, and it's just something I've been doing all this time. But a paragraph really sets like in a reader's mind that like, oh, we're moving to a new paragraph. So we must be moving to a new idea because if you just in the middle of a paragraph jump, you're talking about the same exact idea and you make no other difference, a reader is going to be really confused. Like, why did you make this jump? So even looking at an image here where we can't really tell like what is going on, you see that there are chunks, paragraphs, and we can guess that this paragraph has one idea, this paragraph has another, that one has another, et cetera. So even from a distance, paragraphs give that visual cue that you are going to talk about a new idea, okay? And often, in, especially in academic writing, we want to have topic sentences that announce the paragraph's main focus. It creates a transition from ideas and it also connects the ideas to the thesis statement. So your topic sentence is just basically going to be your baby thesis. So your thesis summarizes what the whole essay is about, Whereas your topic sentence is basically saying, this is what this paragraph is about. And this is how it relates back to my main idea. So your paragraphing and topic sentences are super important for helping the reader get a general understanding of when you're moving from one idea to the next idea. Now, the next 
thing we're going to talk about is cohesive devices, which really work as the glue to hold your whole essay together. And cohesive devices guide readers, helping them follow the writer's train of thought by connecting keywords and phrases throughout a passage. So for example, one type of cohesive device is a pronoun. So instead of just saying, Charlotte did this, Charlotte did that, Charlotte went over and did this thing, you're going to use a pronoun, she in this case, to connect that I was doing this thing, and then I was doing that thing, and then I was doing this thing. And by using those pronouns, you or my name, you are connecting these ideas to say that I was the one doing all these things, not somebody else. Um, you might also use word rep repetition. I highly suggest this throughout your essay, especially thinking about your keywords. So in your thesis statement, you might use a few keywords that are super important. And then throughout the essay, in your topic sentences and in your individual paragraphs, repeat those keywords so that readers know, oh, this is how it connects back to the main idea. Here's how these things are connected. I can see that. And of course, it's great to use synonyms so that you're not using the same words all the time, but you really want to repeat those few key words so that readers understand from beginning to end that you are talking about this topic and you can see it in the topic sentences, et cetera. And obviously synonyms are great when you don't want to keep repeating the same word over and over, but you still want to keep that idea. Um, the less cohesive device might be a repetition of sentence structure. So you might have like, I went to the mall, I went to the store, I went to church, I went back home. And you might say like, in certain cases that this is tying these ideas together. And you're really having a rhetorical strategy of why are you writing it this particular way? And in some cases it can, that repetition can help show where the changes are and recognize the importance of those changes. So the next might be transitions. So your transition is basically informing your reader that I'm going to go from point A, which I talked a lot about, and now I'm moving to point B. So don't, like, don't confuse my points in point B with my points from point A because I'm moving from point A to point B. But you don't just wanna like be here and then be like, boop, <laughs> I'm suddenly over B now. By the way, I'm talking about something different because that can be really confusing. Um, so basically your transitions are working as a bridge between these two points. And they can be, depending on how, how long your writing is, it can be a full paragraph, it can be a sentence, even a clause. So like after I went to the mall, comma, then I did this to say, here's things that were happening at the mall and here are things that are happening after the mall. So I'm having this little transition phrase right here that says after the mall, okay? Um, another thing might be having um, words that explain the type of connection. So you might say in comparison to that or contrasting that idea, um, which tells you how are these two ideas related? So those are lots of words like however or in comparison or in contrast, et cetera. And those let you know, again, how these two ideas are related. And lastly, transitions can help readers anticipate how the next paragraph will relate to the paragraph that we are leaving. Now we're going to talk about a number of different types of transitions. So the first type of transition is a logical transition. So it might introduce items in a series so that we're saying like, first you do this, second you do this, then you do this, et cetera, that you're kind of moving through a series. Um, it might introduce an, an illustration or a specification. So if I'm saying like, I really like tea, for example, chai tea and you know green tea. So here are types of things that I'm talking about. Um, it might introduce a result or a cause. So things like as a result, hence, accordingly, thus, so um, a restatement. So especially if you're using a quotation, you'll definitely want to restate the quote in your own words, explain how it relates to what you're trying to say and your main argument. Um, you might have a conclusion or a summary. So lots of times you might give a large example and you're like, in summary, this. So if you didn't get the main point from that, you know, here, here's what you should get out of it. Um, you might be introducing an opposing event. So if you have your um, refutation, you might be talking about, however, 
like nevertheless on the contrary so these are words explaining like hey we were talking about this but you might also want to think about this too which you know is against that original claim um and in kind of opposition to your reputation you might give a concession so a concession in general is just you know you're arguing your point and you might say you know the other side does have a good point about this thing um i can give them that argument they they have that they win that round however they should not win the whole argument because you know my argument is superior so you might introduce that transition by saying like certainly like group a believes this and they're right about that or for like granted group a all right and the last kind of logical transition is resuming the original line after concession so this is you might have your opposing viewpoint your concession and then resuming and you say like despite what group a says like my point is still is still the best so nonetheless even though still etc now the next type of transition are temporal transitions so when we're talking about temporal we're just thinking about time so it might talk about frequency how often something is happening or duration how long something is happening so you know is it an hour a minute is it happening during something or after something um, it might indicate a particular time such as now or last sunday or in 2019 for example um, indicate the beginning the middle and the end so if you're having at first this happened then that happened and finally this happened you know, those are kind of working into our logical se sequential, but you can also think about it as a moment in time, especially if you're talking about a story. So our next are thinking about spatial transitions. So tra spatial transitions are really thinking about space, that, thing is, that things are happening. So you're going to orient readers to objects in a scene. So you might indicate that something is close or far or up or down so your direction so this is basically you're trying to create a map in your reader's mind of where they are in relation to everything else and everyone else in the room our next cueing the reader strategy is using headings and subheadings so these are basically just brief phrases set off from the text that provide visual cues to the reader about the context and organization of the text so we talked about some classification. So headings indicate sections and levels with hierarchies and classifications. So you might have a really big bold word that says, you know, this is a general category, and then you have smaller bold or italicized words farther down that say, you know, this is still part of that larger category, and thus it belongs within that. Okay, so it might also indicate, you know, as you're reading, this happens a lot in textbooks that as you're reading, you know, you might be able to skim and just look at the headings and go like, oh, um, I'm looking for category four. So you like page through because like in this, you know, our heading is up here. So if this were a textbook, you might say like, oh, I want to know about headings and subheadings. So you'd have to go through like the transitions and um, forecasting statements and all of that in order to get to headings and subheadings. And if you're looking through a textbook, you can just flip the pages until you get to that spot. Instead of just having lots of paragraphs where you kind of have to read a little more deeply in order to see when the ideas are changing. Now, one thing that you should take into account is that headings are not common in most genres. Um, for example, they are not um, common in narrative writing or descriptive writing. They often appear in like concept or maybe a research essay so we might be looking at a research essay in which it has you know the methodology the introduction the conclusions okay so we're used to seeing it there whereas if you're reading a novel aside from chapter breaks you don't have headings throughout and you know we can kind of think about genre conventions in that way of thinking does the genre and in generally include headings and subheadings and kind of understand from what you're writing, is this an expectation of that genre? Now, the last thing to know, if you are going to use headings and subheadings in your writing, is that you need to have two headings at each level, or more, obviously, but you should not just have 
a heading where there's going to be nothing below it. Like in that case, you don't need it because it's not being separated from anything else. Okay, so those are our strategies for queuing the reader. We have theses and forecasting statements that orient readers to ideas and organization. We have paragraphing that groups related ideas and details. We have cohesive devices that work as the glue to connect ideas one to another and bring about clarity. We have transitions that signal relationships or shifts in meaning from point A to point B. And we have headings and subheadings that group related paragraphs and help readers locate specific information quickly. All right, so that is all for today. Thank you so much for listening. If you have any questions, comments, or concerns about this information, please let me know as soon as possible. Thank you, bye.